Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another installment of Into the Necrosphere. I am joined on this episode by Nikita Comrade of uh, Der Weg Einer Freiheit. Uh, he very kindly agreed to do a track-by-track -track breakdown of the new record Nocturne. And along the way, we spoke about a variety of different topics, including dreams, sound engineering, uh, and all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. Great guy, super articulate, uh, an absolute pleasure to have on the show. And I'm very confident that you are all going to thoroughly enjoy the conversation that we had. Um, before we get to that, however, it is time for another demo of the week. And uh, this week's uh, project is one called Yaverbog, hailing out of Seattle, Washington, the brainchild of uh, Joel Hackett, who provides all instrumentation and vocals on this song, uh, with the exception of the drums that was provided by Robin Stone of Norse. Um, actually, just as a sidebar, uh, ever since I've reviewed that last Norse record, uh, a lot of you have been reaching out to me telling me what a great album it is, how much you enjoy it. Um, so I'm definitely going to get Robin on the show at some point soon. Um, but uh, be that as it may, it was actually him that reached out to me, told me that he'd played on the song, and told me that I needed to check it out. And uh, that is why this week, Yeverbog is my demo of the week.
What you just heard was the sounds of Yeverbog ascending to that lofty plane in the underground that uh, few have reached, uh, but many strive to find. Uh, the Into the Necrosphere demo of the week spotlight. Um, and uh, they join the likes of Trivax, Born Ultra, and many, many more. Uh, the song, like I said, A Golden Reaper, it's off the EP of the same name, um, and it is available right now on Bandcamp. So check it out. And uh, if you're a record label, uh, I would strongly suggest you get on that shit. It's really, really solid stuff. I'm befuddled as to why no one has, uh, has noticed this yet. But uh, either way, hopefully this, uh, this contributes uh, in a uh, in a small way to their success. Um, anyway, uh, a couple of other things to uh, let all of you know about before we get the show up and running. Uh, there's going to be a couple of reviews after my conversation with Nikita. This week, I'm talking about the new Hordum Rife, uh, the new uh, Ars Magna Umbra, as well as the new Voices, which uh, actually comes out or came out this weekend. Uh, probably my most anticipated release of uh, of the last 12 months, uh, maybe the last several years, to be quite honest with you. And uh, the question is, does it live up to my expectations? You'll find out uh, in about an hour and a half's time. I'm also going to do a bit of a news rant, uh, including a, uh, a piece of personal news that I have found particularly vexing. Uh, if you follow the news, you'll probably know what I'm talking about, but... Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be talking about that in uh, in a bit more detail after those reviews. Uh, a reminder, if you're new to the podcast, elbow drop that subscribe button. Um, share, like, comment, subscribe. Keep leaving those reviews on uh, Apple Podcasts or whatever the case may be. On the topic of Apple Podcasts, uh, I got uh, notified last week that um, the show was the 45th most popular uh, music podcast in uh, North America. Uh, I think that came off the back of uh, of Gaul uh, and of Necrofire. But either way, I was absolutely fucking speechless when I saw that news. Um, you know, the, for those wondering, the list does not consist of 45 podcasts. It, uh, it cuts off at 250. Um, you know, so there was support that I received uh, from you guys again. And like, I, like I've said many times before, it's not something I would ever take for granted. I'm blown away by how many people are liking and responding to the show. And that motivates me in turn to keep doing better things and, um, you know, hopefully keep improving the podcast. Um, if you do love the show and you want to rep your colors publicly, obviously head over to the Teespring store and pick up a, uh, a hoodie or a uh, T-shirt or a jogger or whatever else catches your fancy. Uh, and of course, follow the show on the socials. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and on Twitter. And if you want to reach out to me, if you're in a band and you've just recorded your finest work and you go, fuck the Grammys, I don't care about record labels. All I want is the love and adoration of Jackie and all of the Into the Necrosphere legions. Then uh, shoot me an email on into the necrosphere at gmail.com. And if I like what I hear, I will feature the band on the show. And if I really like what I hear, who knows, maybe you'll even uh, get to be a guest on the podcast. Speaking of guests, about to welcome to the show for the first time ever, Nikita Comrade of Der Weg Einer Freiheit. So big day for you today. New uh, new album is coming out, and I, I I must say I think it kind of speaks to the the lasting impact that the that the last record has. That I I feel like there's a lot of anticipation about the around this album. Like it it feels to me like where the previous record was, you know, one that kind of came out and and from my observation surprised a lot of people. This feels like one of those event releases, you know, like if you liken it to, to video games, it's like a triple A release, you know, <laughs> this is, it's what are you, uh, I guess, how, how are you experiencing it first and foremost? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was four years now uh, from the previous release, Finisterre, until now, uh, release of Nocturne, which is today. Um, that's really cool. And um, I have the feeling that many people anticipated it a lot. And uh, we personally, of course, as well, because um, there was much effort flowing into the album and um, much work. And also the label uh, was very supportive, supportive right from the beginning when we sent the demos and um, doing all the scheduling and stuff like that. They took it very, very seriously. So. Um, that's a great thing, and I have the impression as well that that's definitely a step up uh, from the from the previous album. Yeah, no, I, I, for sure, and I think what's what's interesting for me in that regard as well is obviously 
I think there was a lot made initially about how experiment, not not even maybe experimental, but you know, there's there's a couple of creative sort of sidesteps for you guys in this. I don't think it's a, a you know anything away from how you normally approach songwriting, but definitely when I when I heard um, uh, you know as a lot of people when I heard Immortal for the first time, I was like, whoa, okay, this is quite a bit different. But it, it, it was it was different, but it still sounded like you guys, which is which is which is what I liked. But were you? Were you nervous about putting that out as a single, given you know, given what people might you know, what the purists might say? <laughs> Definitely, uh, this was one of the uh, most important songs, or is one of the most important songs on the album because it was the first song I wrote, and it was the first song that uh, got me into bringing synthesizers in into the music of the Veganer Freiheit, which I never did before. Uh, so it was like a. a yeah, it opened a lot of doors and also bringing uh, David uh, Marco, aka The Devil's Trade, um, as a guest vocalist. Uh, this song is really a completely new thing for the band. And um, that's why it's so important for us. And uh, honestly, I must say that um, after releasing Finisterre, or already at the um, production process of Finisterre, I had the feeling that um, it's a solid album and um, yeah, people liked it a lot in the end, which is great, but uh, nothing too special happens or nothing nothing too innovative uh, happens yeah, on the yeah, album. Yeah. So um, after the release, I, I thought like, well, I could have done more of new things. Uh, I, I shouldn't have been too afraid of doing new things. And uh, that's a feeling I left behind on Nocturne with Nocturne, I thought like, well, let's just do whatever I like. And uh, what came out were songs like Immortal or also Haven, which is the other very special song on the album. I mean, the other ones are special too, but uh, they're rather hitting the more traditional um, way. Yeah, yeah. Um, which which is why I was surprised, especially when I heard the whole record, like, you know, I thought it was a very bold step to, to put out Immortal and say, right, this is, this is you know, our... our this is the direction potentially that the new music is going in because a lot of the the other songs, as you say, it hits on a more traditional, uh, a more traditional sound for you guys. Um, not not in a bad way. I think one thing that that really stands out to me from the the get go of of listening to the record, it sounds very cinematic. Um, you know, I, there's this. I, I know you mentioned Chopin as a, uh, as a as a as a big influence, but I was immediately thinking about. Uh, you know some of my favorite film scores. You know, like uh, the the film score to the Joker movie, for example, or you know just some of my favorite sort of uh, uh, f- film musicians, like Johnny Greenwood, for example, came to mind as well. And and Haven was one I was going to bring up later. And actually, if you, you don't mind, I'd love to do like a track by track rundown as well of of it because mm-hmm. it's it's super interesting to, to me the songs because they all have such a unique identity, but. You know, Haven for me evokes these images of of Radiohead. You know, in a in a in a good way. Yeah, great. Whereas Immortal, I, I kind of immediately think of Madrugada, especially that first, you know, that kind of that opening bit with a with a clean singing. But cool. how much of the 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 I guess this new creative freedom came from just your direction, or how much of it was uh, was with input from the band? Because I know from the things that I've read that this was the first time uh, that this project, I guess, in terms of writing, was done far more collaboratively as a, as a unit than, than previous records. Um, it was rather the, the production itself in the studio and the preparations uh, where all the band took, uh, took part in and was involved, um, which was never the case uh, before. It was actually only Tobias, the drummer, and me um, locking ourselves up in the studio uh, and... Tobias leaving at, I don't know, after a week, after we tracked the drums and then later I did the rest. And it was a very exhausting process. So I wanted to change that in particular on the new album. Still, the songwriting itself, it was basically all still in my hands. Um, I did all the demos uh, at home at my home studio and um, yeah, the basic songs um, so we could play them. And um, I sent the tracks to the other guys and the taps uh, on Guitar Pro and they rehearsed for themselves at home. So we met up in a rehearsal in October last year where we wanted to try out this new approach of having all the band and and recording the songs actually live in one room. Mm. 
we wanted to try that out on uh, in this week in October last year, and we found out that it worked pretty well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always a risk to uh, to record an album in a live situation because many things can go wrong. But you know, everyone took it very seriously, and um, everyone had the, had his own uh, responsibility uh, of his own instrument, of course. So um, it turned out to be the best decision we could do and then later in March this year uh, record the album and um, you know um, I wrote the songs as I said but still uh, each band member has his own unique character and uh, way of playing his instrument and bringing on bringing in um, yeah his unique style of playing and uh, that makes a, a huge difference in the end um, of making uh, this, this this album sound um, sound so different. Mm. Uh, I would imagine the, that that comes out especially when you record live, as you as you've said. And that is is that the first time that the band has done that? Yeah, that was the first time. Actually, the, the second, uh, if you, if you will, because we did this live uh, in Berlin live album. Uh, mm. uh, we recorded it back in 2017 on on our Finisterre release show, uh, Finisterre release tour. Um, we did that in Berlin, and uh, in 2019 we released it. So two two years later, but we found out that this live album actually delivers some kind of energy you don't find on the previous studio recordings, as we we didn't record it as a band, um, and that's what actually I was missing all the time in the studio recordings. So that was the initial point where I thought. Well, we're having this really nice live recording. Why not doing it the same way in the studio, actually, and mm -hmm. having this certain energies bound on a studio recording? I was just about to say. So it was that experience that that led you to do it this way uh, for for the new record. Yeah, basically, it was a live album. Yeah, and yeah. especially the, the just the general atmosphere we have in the band. We're all very good friends and know each other very well on a personal basis not only musically but everything uh, yeah fits perfectly actually and uh why not using this on a studio recording yeah yeah it's just so so how different is it being in the studio and doing it that way to the way that you that, you know that you would traditionally record like how how close would you get obviously without a crowd but how, how close would you get to recreating the live studio environment like you know, I, I think I think back to some of the the legendary stuff that you'd you'd read about someone like Henry Rollins who would like do his vocals live and in between songs he's doing press ups and doing all sorts of crazy shit. Like like how you know what what were some of the things that you guys did to create that live atmosphere and create that live and recreate that live energy? You know, we were in one room looking at at each other like in a in a circle actually and. Um, yeah, turning on uh, on some moody lights, for example. The monitoring sound is very important. We um, uh, we uh, spent a lot of time in um, doing the best monitoring sound we could have. So everyone's feeling very comfortable. And that's the basic thing we did. Uh, we just wanted to, um, to be as comfortable as possible during the recordings. Of course, we didn't do any rituals or something like that. <laughs> I was just about um, to say, when did, when, uh, did, when did you lay out the pentagram and the candles yeah. before you started? <laughs> yeah. Candles would be nice, but you know, in a studio, uh, it's it's uh, dangerous <laughs> to put yeah, a candle. No, I, 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 um, I, can, I can imagine. Uh, how, so, so like how many takes would you typically do for, for songs if you're recording it that way? And would, like, was every single take live so if one person fucks up, the whole band starts from scratch? Um, basically, um, oh, first, uh, we did around about four or five takes per song. We actually did like a one song per day. Uh, we focused on one song per day. And uh, yeah, we did. We, we woke up, had breakfast, met up in the studio um, at, I don't know, 10 to 11, something like that started tracking and at one or something uh, we had these four or five takes and there was always one take in particular actually we were had the impression that this one was really good and we can take it as a basis of course 
it happened that um, it was not flawless or uh, Tobias fucked up a drum fill or we fucked up something on the guitar or something like that. Of course, that happens. But um, the good thing is uh, we have all the other takes and we're playing uh, after a click. So we can swap just uh, one drum fill or something or a guitar line uh, that was that had a mistake in it. And of course, um, if you do this, more than you have to it will destroy the live atmosphere yeah, but yeah. we uh we really focused on not not overdoing this you know we only um corrected the very very obvious mistakes or re-recorded them of course but uh yeah you can hear if you listen closely you can hear many mistakes so to say uh in all the instruments throughout the album but you know, that's, it's not the, um, we didn't want to do the live recording because uh, doing it as perfect as possible, we wanted to do it to to have the certain energies of a live recording. Yeah. And that means also having mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Well, which is, which is again, that's, that's uh, in my view, that's where the magic comes in. You know, yeah. I, I've spoken so much on this podcast about, like two of my favorite examples of that, like uh, Immortals Battles in the North, you know, which we know is is as near live as possible, and there's so many fuck ups on that album, <laughs> but it it's it's part of the charm, and it's it's the same with um like the the first Deer Side record. I mean, there's there's bits where Steve isn't even hitting the snare drum properly anymore. <laughs> it's like it just, but it's it's again, it's it's kind of part of the charm. But it was interesting when you when when you when I read about the album being recorded live because listening to it on my hi fi, and I've got I'm a I'm a fidelity junkie, so I, I have I. I uh, you know, I love listening to great recordings. I love kind of, you know, I, I guess appreciating great recordings. The, the sound on the record is spectacular. I think it's one of the one of the the cleanest, um, but one of the warmest productions I've heard on a black metal record all year. You know, it, it sounds absolutely phenomenal. Where was the record recorded? It was in Ghost City Recordings uh, in a studio in Bavaria near Nuremberg, which is which is uh, where you work as well, right? <laughs> Yeah, I worked a lot there. Um, uh, right now, I'm not doing too much uh, band productions, uh, so I can do my mixes, mastering stuff uh, all in my home studio in Würzburg, where I live. Uh, but um, Ghost City Recordings, for me, is the perfect place to do such a production with a whole band in one room. They have the best system available actually to do this with a uh, latency free monitoring which is very important and uh great outboard gear so that's comes comes into play why this record sounds so warm and you know we didn't record on tape or uh fully analog we didn't do that but um still we we tried to yeah um don't have uh too much digital stuff happening um, to maintain this this analog vibe, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, what's the and again, more out of, for my own personal curiosity than anything else, what's the setup like at Ghost City? Like in terms of the the uh, equipment that you have, you know, what type of you know what speakers do they use for for monitoring? You know, I, I'm I'm like I said, super curious about that because right. yeah. in part the speakers I have are the same speakers they use at Abbey Road to to monitor. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Are they so, in a sense or? No, I've got uh, yeah. Bowers and Wilkins 800 D3s. I don't have the D4s. They've they've swapped out the D3s for the D4s now. I don't have money to uh, <laughs> to upgrade just yet. Soon, soon, soon though. Yeah. But like I said, it's always interesting when you like one of the things that you. That's like a weird thing though. The the more you pay for hi-fi equipment, the the closer that it gets you that it gets you to sounding like it sounded in the studio. And then when you put on something like the new Dark Throne record, you go, how the fuck did you pay money for this? But anyway, <laughs> but anyway my, my point is, like I said, with a with new record, it, it sounds so cool. I mean, Haven is an example. I've listened to it three or four times this morning, and it's just immaculate. Great. Uh, yeah, just uh, in the studio at Ghost Studio Recordings, we have, uh, like, I think the biggest models of Genelec speakers with a... 15 inch woofer and um, a lot of bass. And um, yeah, I mean, they cost a lot of money, but it's it's, it's a big studio and a big re uh, control room, so it makes sense. Um, and we also have these NS10s you see everywhere, basically, Yamahas. And um, 
yeah, we, we went straight with all the lines, with all the instruments. We went into the analog uh, console with the preamps and EQing. It sounds very, very good. And um, for the snare, for example, or the kick and later the vocals, we put on some um, analog compression, LA-2As or pull tags on it. And then went into Pro Tools and what came in into the computer was basically already um, processed uh, signals in a way, but not too processed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it, it ended up as a very nice rough mix already. And I mean, that's that's always the best thing in a recording you can get, also having the best signals available and having everything um, being processed as well as possible before hitting the converters and going into the digital uh, computer uh, world. And if you don't have to do anything there too much, that's a good sign. And if you're already recording with a great rough mix, you know, well, yeah, we're doing a good job. And that was the case. Uh, we also had a very, very uh, a great uh, engineer with us. It's Jan Kersher who owns the studio, which is uh, who is a good good friend of mine and um he knows exactly what we want to sound like uh, or what we sound like basically as a band and he um he tried to catch it as good as possible with different uh, mics and uh we swapped some mics here and there also for certain songs or used different snare or tom tunings and stuff like that he he all took care of this it was a big help uh, so I could, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm an audio engineer as well, but uh, I could fully concentrate on just performing and uh, singing. That was very important. So, so you, you know, it comes to the mic swaps and all that sort of stuff. How, how long does it take you when you're going to record live like that? How long does it take you to get the right sound on each instrument? Because again, you 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 hear the you hear the stories of the legend, you know, the legendary stories. Like it took Cannibal Corpse a day to get their drum sound right for the Wretched Spawn. Like, you know, as, as if if I recall the making of DVD correctly. But you know, when you when you have that dynamic where there's going to be multiple you know multiple tracks going all the time, you know, and people are in each other's company and playing, clearly that would be that would require a different type of setup. But like I said, then how long would it take you to get that setup perfect? Uh, as I said, we already did a pre-production at the same studio at Gossel Recordings in October last year. And we already tried out different mics there and took this experience to the album recordings in March this year. So um, it still took one and a half um, days, complete days, uh, to do the sound check, to do mic checks, preamps and everything to get um, the sound we, we wanted. But we also had this experience from the pre-production so that was very useful um but at some point you always have to say well um it could be better maybe but we're already at 99 percent, so yeah, yeah 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 that's all right and of course every every day in the studio costs us money and um we can't spend just a week for a sound check so we had to compress it in one two days and what uh, the the good thing about the guitars, for example, was uh, we were using Camper amplifiers, and um, of course they're fully digital. But uh, I think it's one of the um, the digital guitar amps that delivers the most natural tone and uh, the way you can um, put the effects um, before the amp and after the uh, amp. It recreates like a very very natural analog situation and it sounds just awesome and i i could do all the guitar sounds already at home in my studio so we just plugged in plugged in the camper in the studio then and it was up and running we didn't have to check anything actually and that that uh saved a lot of time yeah and also again it, it created an interesting end result because one of the things that that kind of sticks out to me about the about the guitar sound and i'm you know you would assume it's intentional, but it 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 has on frequently on the record, even in some of the faster bits of the of the of the album, it has a very haunting sound to it, a very kind of haunting effect. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that it, it it aligns into that natural you know warmth we were talking about earlier as well, uh, but works so well together with the music too. Yeah, we we changed the uh, uh, guitar song 
Absolutely, actually completely like uh we always used uh high gain angle styled uh amps and profiles or also back in the day i used to play an um, angle fireball uh, for years and i love this amp but right now for the new record we just tried out the very old school thing like having a tube screamer in front of a vintage amp it was uh, like the profile of the amp was an um Fender Deluxe something and that with a with a tube scream in front it just sound sound great but not too high gainy not too harsh um rather vintage more in a way and yeah warmer and um more round in a way uh not the this high gain fizzling golden high top in the guitars and that was my approach my personal approach for this album and it yeah i think it, it works very well on the songs and right now we're on tour playing a couple of shows fortunately and using this same sound setup for the old songs as well and uh it turned out that it sounds awesome as well so yeah that's a cool thing how, uh, how how are people receiving the new material uh now that you're on tour that i would assume that's part of the set list right yeah, we played the whole album, except for one song, uh, unfortunately, but um, especially Immortal. Uh, we, you know, we have the Devil's Trade, David, we have him on tour here, uh, he's our support act. And that came, of course, with the idea to have him uh, performing Immortal Life on stage with us. And we did that yesterday, the very first time. It was just mind blowing for everyone on stage. but hopefully also in the audience i think the reaction were quite uh quite good and the people were surprised but um yeah uh i was at on stage i was at loss for words i couldn't think about anything it turned out just way better than i have ever expected by the way my apologies as you can hear the fucking hound of hell here in the background is barking because <laughs> i, think I didn't hear that <laughs> a delivery person yeah she 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 picks the perfect perfect times to do it too i was i was talking to goal uh, a couple of weeks ago and you know I, i've i've done many of these conversations that's never something i get nervous about but him i was a bit nervous about one because i had a fucking horrendous experience talking to him in 2006 where literally we ran out of stuff to say to each other within about eight minutes. And so, cool. so I was nervous about it. And also, you know, I'm a big fan of his music. So yeah, I sure. wanted to make sure I, I, I nail it. And we're about two, three minutes into the conversation and immediately, you know, both oh, yeah. turned up. So she's furious. It's like of all the fucking times when this could be happening. Oh, anyway, if she, uh, if she makes a record, yeah. I'll, I'll threaten to send her to the glue factory. <laughs> so, so so tell me a little about how you got into the audio engineering uh game because you you've done some pretty cool stuff and, I've, and i you you were also clearly you know quite closely involved in this in this record i know you've been closely involved in all of the uh der Weg der uh, records before but how did you get into audio engineering and i guess what, what's kind of the in fact i'll, pa I'll pause there. i'm not gonna ask you 20 questions in one <laughs> how did you get into this racket you know you start a band you always want to do recordings there's always one guy having to deal with it and uh i was up for it uh, in my previous bands or in the very early days and uh i was yeah somehow always like a tech nerd in a way with not really with guitars but with this um yeah, sound stuff like uh i started off with a simple mini disc recorder or player back in the days uh, which had two inputs so i could plug in a guitar and a vocal or another microphone in it and record on a minute mini disc that was very the first time i record stuff and um yeah later on i got my own computer and a correct version of cubase uh vst24 or something I was about to say the correct version so one that wasn't illegally downloaded <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got more and more into it and then buying stuff and uh, I don't know, later at some point getting to know Jan from Ghost City Recordings and uh, we did um, the Stellar record together. He was the producer and later I recorded Finisterre at the same place, but with me being the producer, which was a lot of work, of course, and taking care of everything. 
and yeah, uh, in in the times between, uh, yeah, uh, I did as many recordings as possible and mixes and uh, many underground bands, but here and there also like uh, uh, bigger band, not bigger bands, but um, yeah, some more well-known bands. Um, yeah, and that was a lot of learning over the past 10, 12 years and uh, learning by doing basically. So who, who are some of the, the audio engineers and the, the producers who you really admire or who you think, you know, either historically have done tremendous work or, or currently are doing incredible stuff? Definitely Kurt Ballou. He's a great um, uh, influence in drum sound for uh, especially. Um, um, not sure. Yeah, <laughs> that's the only name I can. Nikita, I can Nikita tell. Comprod, I hear he's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, no, as I said, Jan Kesha, who owns Ghost City Recordings, he's not. Uh, he's actually not doing metal at all. We we were his uh, in the past years. The only metal uh, production he did, I think. And uh, but he's doing um, a lot of electronic indies, sometimes pop uh, stuff, which is not the simple pop you hear in the radio, but very yeah, yeah. very sophisticated. And he's got his own project like Lovers, uh, that's really really co uh, cool and many emotions in it. It's you know it's catchy music in a way, but still has so much more in it, uh, so much more emotions and yeah. Yeah, these two guys. Is that would you want to spread your wings out uh, towards other styles of music as well further on in your career when you you know either as a musician or as a or as an engineer? Definitely, I'm always I'm I'm not narrow minded. I always want to uh, get to know new stuff and new approaches in production. I did that on the on the record, and it turned out that for us personally in the band, also Immortal and Haven are our favorite songs on the album because they are so different and because there are uh, different ways of producing involved also. And uh, that showed me that I, I just want to, uh, to explore these sides of producing music more and more in the, in the future. You know, it won't turn out that there will be a Der Veganer Freiheit album full of Haven songs, but um, Haven was or Immortal was were like they opened doors a lot. I think uh, for us as a band, but for me, for for my head as well. Yeah, no, I agree. And the thing is, I think also what it does is creates dynamic on a or dynamics on a record and pe you know peaks and valleys. I, I I think if you, as you say, if you do a whole record like that then then that would be something that you do as, as a solo project but yeah maybe when you have when you have those moments on an album that are very different but kind of in line with the theme of the rest of the music those to me are, the, are, are you know where the real highlights come in and it also makes you as a listener if you're listening to it end to end for those few of us that that, that still listen to albums that way it makes those faster songs and those more aggressive songs, it makes them sound more special as well because they mm -hmm. have something to kind of contrast against. Like if you have a whole album where from start to finish, it's just blasting and screaming, that, yeah. that's cool too. But I, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm 41 years old. I've, I've heard the best of the best do that. And mm -hmm. I kind of feel like it's been done. I don't know how much more you could do that and still be, and still be great. I mean, there's only going to be one Battles in the North. There's only going to be yeah. one uh, Plague Angel. There's no point in yeah. trying to kind of top those when there's so much else that you could be doing. And I think also, you know, black metal just as a, a genre, and again, something I've spoken about a lot, it, it's, I think the conservatism in black metal has gone pretty much, I mean, from my observation anyway, it's pretty much extinct, at least musically. There's so yeah. much, so many different bands and sounds and stuff going on in the scene. It's what makes the scene as exciting as it is right now. Yeah, I have the impression as well, and especially in black metal, um, I have the feeling that this genre in particular uh, even has more room to play with different elements, styles, yeah, to bring in and make something new. And that's cool to experience that in the last years, you know, when we started in 2009, was a different, it was kind of different because we, got a lot of hate comments for example for 
yeah looking like hipsters or students and playing black metal well um but that is gone basically we we didn't receive such comments in a long time and uh, all this development showed us that well yeah the there's a new new approach there's a new um thinking about black metal i think or music I in general yeah i i 100 agree i think there's uh, it's weird because it's ironically it's in line with your with your name you know the the way the way of freedom i i i <laughs> yeah. think that that um uh and i often reference when when gall was talking about what um what Satan means to him. And he said, freedom. And I often think back to that. And I think like that to me feels like it's become philosophically ingrained in, in the black metal scene as it is today. And I think it's, and I think that philosophy translates to the way music is being written right now and when music is being produced again, which is why I think there's so many interesting and different things coming out. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I, I know, I know exactly what you're talking about back in the, back in the eighties, if you were in a, in a thrash band, for example, you know, you put one, semi ballad on there and you're a poser and a sellout you know death metal if you like a shred of clean singing garbage you know, yeah, yeah, sure. if you weren't wearing corpse paint in the early 90s you were a poser and a wimp or in 2009 as well yeah yeah well so i was going to ask you like what were some of the crazy things that people said to you when you came out um uh i have to translate it in english now it was a german comment but um I hope I can say that actually. Uh, <laughs> so show, that yeah, yeah. Go back to the disco, you fucking. <laughs> no, it was uh, show these um, wimp posers the goat hammer into their ass, something like that. <laughs> that was the craziest comment. Yeah, <laughs> German, but I, I tried to recreate it in English. Now. <laughs> People are uh, like I said, they were very passionate in those days. I mean, there was like a there's like a certain charm to the Neanderthal. I <laughs> always try to laugh. Days too. Yeah, you know, I always try to laugh about it because, um, you know, at in real life, we never got the, these comments at a show or somewhere. These are all in the internet, and oh uh, yeah, yeah, if no one knocks on my door and screams at me, I hate you. Um, yeah, where's the point? And so I never got into the conversation or or uh, tried to act like. Well, uh, you're doing bad. Uh, you don't. I think as a band, you should shouldn't respond to comments like that. No, that no. doesn't make sense. I, well, I, the worst thing you can do is respond to it because that just fuels Actually, the fire. The um, the, uh, the I, I mean, I, I was talking about like the old school Neanderthal approach to stuff. I think it was Osmos Records that back in the '90s every single one of their magazine ads in metal maniacs or something like that would literally like massive at the top of the page say not for pussies <laughs> for the new releases there never, was there was a lot of moments of, of very <laughs> unintentional comedy because, because of the way those labels and those bands were but let's let's talk about the tracks because uh, we've kind of skirted around it a little bit and like i said i'm keen to sort of get a, a rundown like a track by track rundown from you uh, and I don't want to share some of my own thoughts on it too. But so we start off with Finstetta uh, 2, which is just a really nice, like beautifully somber and, and atmospheric intro, which also you you do the right thing and you don't stretch it out for eight minutes. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, short, sharp to the point, sets the scene for the for the record. Um, any comments that you want to make around that? I always want to include a acoustic guitar in the music. I never did before. And um, yeah, the, this was an idea um, that this riff, this song, um, I had been lying around many years now. And I, when the songs were finished, I thought like, well, we can't start off in Monument um, in the second song on the album, just how it is it needs some kind of introduction to the album and that's the reason why finished hair is there or finished tattoo is there uh also to have like a you know you know like um a very intimate kind of feeling before the actual album starts like uh i don't know the english word right now but um you know listening for yourself for these two uh, one and a half minutes and then 
the album starts actually uh i i think i'll i'll take a guess and say you 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 probably the word you're looking for is introspective or, or kind of reflective because totally. that's again yeah. that's that's <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind for me and it, it was i wanted to ask you if you think about like if i think of the atmosphere that comes straight off the record as soon as i listen to it that, that reflective introspective piece a natural question that comes up how much of the craziness of what's been going on over the last you know 21 months how much of that impacted your writing or, or influenced the way this music ended up coming out because i know obviously you're not seeing directly about like every you know second fucking death call band the plague but there's also there's you know there's there's the plague and there's the media and there's all the all the crap on the surface but there's what happens beneath the surface with all of us and how we're experiencing the changes in society and the the changes in which we're, we're living, all that sort of stuff that if, if, if impacts on us emotionally and, and and personally. So I guess in a long winded way, how did that how did that affect how your music ended up coming out on this record? I think in general, the pandemic brought up many problems that were maybe invisible in the background in in our society in our world uh, that brought it up suddenly and make it visible and um you know many people had to deal with solitude now uh because they were forced to stay at home and couldn't work or something like that or in the life in the music um life sector uh yeah basically everyone lost his job right from one day to another and still um we're very fortunate to do these shows right now but um it's not uh like the normal thing right now and uh you know we had we even had um struggles finding uh, a light technician because he started to do st studying now because yeah he had no job anymore since two years almost um but for me personally in the songwriting um the pandemic or everything's going on in the world it somehow has a an impact on the lyrics especially but not, you know, I don't want to sing about a plague or something very um, uh, cliche. Yeah, cliche. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, of course, I somehow reflect on what's going on, but you can tell a very uh, certain, um, yeah, like a sentence or phrase or a song lyrics that's going, uh, that, that that's, uh, uh, themed on what's going on it's the main image actually i i think many things go wrong and already went wrong when i wrote finis terbe and that's also why the album is called finis terbe because i had the feeling like well the world's going down somehow and um still i have the feeling um in many different uh parts in our society in the world well, here's something, here's something freaky I saw the other day. So there's a geopolitical analyst named George Friedman, who I love his stuff. He's, he's, he's brilliant. He writes these books where he kind of predicts at a geopolitical level what he thinks is going to happen in the next 10 years. And he writes it almost every single year. One of the, his last book was published in February 2020. And it was based on the premise that every 50 years, there is a seismic event in the world. So it, it's, you know, it, and it normally is, accompanied with mass political unrest um upheaval you know various things and you know if he was kind of he was kind of working it back to say you know we had a mass political event in uh 1910 which ultimately in the, or not 1910 sorry 1914 which ended up leading to the uh what's the same the uh the first world war and the yeah. first world war and he, he theorizes the second world war is really just a continuation of that yeah. Um, it was kind of like they had a, a little a breather and then they said, right, let's pick up the guns and start again. And then there's, it, it kind of replicates. And he's, his theory was that the next major event would happen in 2020, which again, he published, publishes a book about it in Feb and by March, everything is fucking, you know, every, everything is different and everything, you know, not just because of the, the pandemic, but there's social upheaval because of it everywhere. Like every, all of the things that were going wrong, it was like the pandemic just poured the petrol on the fire to 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 really kind of get it going. Um, mm. But so then let's move on to the, the next track. So the first proper track, Monument, then yeah. kicks us off. Um, again, I think you're absolutely right. It, it's definitely a song that needed a, a, a an intro, but then when it does kick off, you know, it it, it's got so much impact because yeah. of the intro that came before. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, the funny thing actually is uh, Monument itself also have an intro, uh, like, or two intros even. Uh, there's this main riff, or this main riff, um, this intro riff, um, which also was a riff I wrote back in, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, uh, always lying around on my hard drive and never touched it. But then I had the feeling that, well, now's the time, maybe I can, I can use it. And um, then there's this very fragile, uh, clean part just before the blast beats um, breaks loose. And so you have the intro, the actual album intro, another song intro, and another short, um, clean intro, intros, intros, intros. Uh, but I have the feeling that it works very well. It, 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 you know, it's in total like four minutes of calming um very uh atmospheric um music that brings you in a certain mood and then suddenly it breaks out and it totally makes sense for me and it turned out that live also we play this as the first track with the intro uh with finnis tattoo and um yeah it 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 brings you in a certain mood um you can't just go on stage and just yeah uh Hit the first. Start doing the, start doing the hair whips. Two blast beats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. L- lyrically, how would you describe the song? Um, it uh, is based on experience I had in my dreams. Um, like there's some image I I always dream, like being at one place and just in in a second ble- being just on another place. Like I in a dream, I see a mountain. And just in five seconds, I'm on top of this mountain. I can fly there somehow. Dreams are for me a very, very important um, thing uh, for my personal freedom. I feel free in dreams and can do whatever I like. And having these kind of images returning since many years now, I wanted to uh, to have these in, in the lyrics. And that's uh, especially what Monument is about. It's just images I, I have in dreams have you looked a lot i mean i would assume you have looked a lot into like the meaning of dreams and and what that what that vision in your mind with, with, of the mountain would, would mean um there's also this image like being on top of the mountain i can look down on on the world uh, or also sometimes i i in a dream i I fly into space and look on the world as a big picture, looking at all the people on, on, on our world. And that, that is something like maybe my mind always want, uh, wants to find a way to escape from, from reality. And uh, yeah, as I said, this is a returning image that, that comes in my dreams. Um, I, 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 I ask because I'm massively interested in that myself. I, and where my interest began is uh, this was probably about 20 years ago. I was in a very, you know, very different place in my life, different relationship. And what I used to experience, what I, what I used to have was a, dream, a recurring dream. And I must have had it for about two years where okay. in, in the dream, I would be, I would, I would be kind of in the middle of a situation where I knew in my mind I'd committed a murder or I'd, I'd committed a, a crime that I was going to have to uh, go to prison for. And yep. in, and I was, the, the dream would basically be me saying goodbye to everybody and going, okay, you know, I'm, I don't know when I'm going to be back, but <laughs> I'll see you when I see you. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I would experience this very intense emotion of, fuck, why did I do that? And, you know, like, like it's, it's like part, part remorse, but also part like knowing I'd gone beyond that point where there was any turning back. Um, and I looked into it and it, and it, it actually was directly related to, to how I was feeling about the relationship at the time, which, as I said, I'm not, I'm not in that relationship anymore, yeah. but it was, it was, it was related to the feeling of feeling trapped, but it was interesting to me that that dream would come up so often over the course of three years. And when I was out of that relationship, it stopped. I've never had one again. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes dreams can can tell a story, can can tell yourself something about you. Of course, you can also dream, uh, use dreams to, well, a different, completely different thing now. To, but to learn an instrument, for example, or to learn for a, a, um, a test or something like that, 
you can do this in in your dreams actually it, when you are able to control them like this lucid dreaming stuff uh i'm not sure if i can do that but um that's I, really I, so i did try and get into that shit when i was much yeah, younger and i never i never got it right though i uh yeah. i will say this i take I, I started taking about probably five years ago i started taking uh zinc vitamin d uh magnesium uh and what else did i start taking something else uh, right before bed <clears throat> because I was having problems sleeping. And I mean, I would get really bad trouble, like insomnia for, probably for about a year or so. And even if I took sleeping tablets, it didn't really do anything. So when mm -hmm. I started taking the, the ZMA and the, the vitamin D and the uh, magnesium, I, my sleep started becoming like super intense, like almost like someone was putting the, switching the power off, but my mm -hmm. dreams also became like really, really vivid as well. And it would be just an insane shit. Like, <laughs> You know, nothing, nothing oh, nightmarish, right. but just, just ridiculous. It's like a fucking ongoing Monty Python sketch. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I'd read a lot, and this was like back in my teens about lucid dreaming and about what you could do to try and control your dreams. But like I said, I've, I've never achieved it. I fucking yeah. wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very heavy, I think, uh, to learn, and you yeah. have to be a person, a, a, a person who's ready for it. Yeah. So next we've got Amaranda der Dunkelheit, and uh, apologies if I'm if I'm butchering uh, oh, the pronunciation great. of it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so Amaranda der, der Dunkelheit, long longer track, long actually, so second second longest song on the album. Tell yeah. me a bit more about that. Uh, musically, you can can't really tell much about it. It came very naturally and just yeah, I think a few days uh, I needed for the song to to get finished. And um, lyrically, uh, maybe there's a, uh, more of a story to tell. And uh, this song um, is about anxiety and panic attacks, um, which I experience is a very, very, in, of course, an intimate and um, uh, fragile kind of subject. And um, I experienced uh, panic attacks with people being very, very close to me. Uh, I never had one, or at least I think I never had one before, but um, having witnessed this in other people um, and seeing them uh, in this state of mind, it moved me. It, it, it had definitely some impact. And um, getting, to more, uh, getting to know more about this subject, like mental health in general and how the body, the, the, the the, the body is connected the physical body is connected to the um to your mind to you to the human mind um yeah just just make me think about things differently and um yeah got me to write these lyrics and um i found out that um talking about mental health and uh you know there's always a reason why you have a panic attack for example uh, there can be traumatas and um things happening in your life you actually even don't know about it don't know about because they're so deep inside of you that only the body knows them but your mind doesn't know and um you know many things uh, many people i think are um afraid of telling um this stuff to other people because also society uh, doesn't care and uh, wants you to not talk about these kind of taboo issues and that's quite a, a massive problem because you know you know you say in germany like uh, having depressions is like the the most popular disease you can get um but no one seem really seems to take it seriously as like uh if you break your leg you see it or break your arm you see the the fracture but you can't look into a human mind uh, so a mental health disease you can't see at the first sight but yeah, you have yeah. to talk about it you you have to address it yeah and i i also think the, the world has a long way to go in terms of how it collectively treats mental health because i i my, my personal view um and I've, I've been very fortunate. I've never had direct experience of, of depression or anxiety attacks or panic attacks, but I've known many people as well. But what I, what my observation has always been in that is that when, for me personally, when doctors choose, when, they, when their immediate response is to medicate 
a mental health problem, exactly to what you just said about the connection between physical health and, and, and your mental state of being, when they immediately choose to medicate the problem rather than trying to attack basic things or, or uh, correct basic things like diet, uh, you know, vitamin intake, exercise, all that sort of stuff, that to me is, is bordering on medical malpractice because it actually just makes the problem worse. But um, the, uh, yeah, like I said, it, I, I do think the world's got a long way to go with that. But to your point about um, ex having experienced people having a panic attack firsthand, I remember someone phoning me once at work, uh, a friend of mine, and again, this was years ago. And when he, when I, it was the most bizarre and the most like shocking thing I've ever experienced in my life. Cause when I, when, when I, when he first started speaking, it sounded like he was laughing and I thought he was just randomly calling me to tell me some joke or something funny that he had seen. And then I realized about, 30 40 seconds in like jesus this guy's like hysterical and i was <laughs> i can i can definitely see where you'd be inspired enough to write a song about it because you know i think unless you've seen that firsthand or you know god forbid experienced it firsthand it's uh it, yeah it's surreal it's it's just the most like shocking thing you could ever see definitely and um, yeah as i said um i got more and more into it and i had the impression that <clears throat> you have to talk about in a way uh, uh it's the only way you can help people or yourself if you're uh, um if you're feeling um this kind if you're having this kind of feeling yourself you need to get help you know there's always friends and family there should be um but there are also professionals like taking care of it but um, most people don't have the, uh, you know, um, I think it's bad to, to go to a, you know, um, mental health doctor, a, a psychiatrist, uh, is it the right word? Psychiatrist, I'm yeah. Not sure. Yeah, um, because, you know, you also go to a doctor uh, if, you, if you're feeling ill or uh, sick. Um, why not uh, going there if you're feeling mentally sick as well? Yeah, but that's yeah. a long way. It's not just going to a doctor and you're well. Um, of course, it's a long way, mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many things lie be beneath the surface; you don't see them. Yeah, no, for sure. But by the way, just before we get, in fact, we this is a good segue into immortal because I I, I heard something funny that you said um, on another interview where you said about how if you sing clean, it's it's really hard to do in in German because German is such a harsh language. Now, here's my question. Did Rammstein make it more acceptable for people to sing clean in German, or did they, or did they make it even more kind of, I wouldn't say embarrassing, but more like you know, okay, I'm going to stick to stick to English when it comes to the to the clean vocals. Well, Rammstein is the most German sounding band I think on the planet, or which is so Germany. weird. Like if you, like I've seen, I've seen them live many times. Like we, you go to a show and it doesn't matter where they're playing. Like, you, you know, they played here to uh, Mil the, uh, the Milton Keynes stadium. And I think there would have been about maybe 20 or 30,000 people there. And yeah. those people are fucking sick. I mean, none of them understand what they're singing at the top of their voices. Like, yeah. Here come this on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, that's great. I've, actually, I'm, I'm, as I said this before, uh, as you mentioned, um, I was not addressing this kind of vocal style or this kind of lyrics and uh, how Rammstein does it, for example. Um, you know, I'm always like uh, the more melodic uh, singing kind of guy. Like there are melodies in Rammstein as well. That's that's for sure but uh you know they're really harsh and they want well, they they i was about to say they they intentionally put the yeah, shoulder yeah. into it but for me um it. clean clean vocals really in our music are there to support the guitar melodies the harmonies and stuff like that and it has to have a, a natural ni nice flow in it and i always found it hard in german clean vocals to have to find this natural flow yeah and um, for me, it was just a logical uh, conclusion to, well, let's, let's just try out the English language because it's a bit smoother. I mean, I would love to sing in French as well, but uh, I can't speak French. Um, that's the unfortunate thing. Um, but French language is also, also very, very nice in its sound. And um, yeah, I picked the English language and I found out, well, that, that suits 
well for me and that works and I feel comfortable and uh, let's just do these two songs on the album. And so then this immortal song is so, I'm trying to find the words for it. It's so provocative and it's so beautiful, but kind of, you know, really sort of harshly emotional as well when the, when the heavy parts kick in. Um, I, how, how did that song come to be? Like what would, you know, you, you said that was the first song that you wrote for this record, correct? Yeah. And was also the, the initial um, point when I, uh, I started to base the whole album concept around the night and nightly uh, dreams, uh, emotions, thoughts, and stuff like that. Uh, because there was one night in or early morning in 2019 um, when I was lying in bed, and maybe you know the state of being half awake, half asleep. Uh, you know, in the in the early morning day, uh, morning hours, you don't want to wake up and you're lying in bed, uh, but you're still kind of dreaming, but not dreaming. It's it's a different state. And in this state of mind, the init- uh, the the, the uh, very basic structure of this song, Immortal, came to my mind, like the very basic drum beat and the bass line and the verse parts to build up the chorus. And um, I had it before my inner eyes, actually, and I could also play it back in my mind, in my dream. And that was such a weird experience to um, to have my dreaming self could write a song, actually. That happened in the past one time as well with the song Ice Wanderer, for example. But with this song, it was something more, something special. And uh, when I woke, woke up, uh, finally, I grabbed a piece of paper and wrote down this basic structure and what I had in mind. Um, and later on in the day, worked on a song and just make a proper song out of it, adding all the other instruments. And uh, yeah. And later, yeah, I was like, okay, um, this was so crazy. I want to base the whole album theme around the night and call it in the end Nocturne. I was just thinking now when you were talking about, you know, how the song came, idea came into your head. Was that not the way that Jimmy Page did Stairway to Heaven as well? Because I think the, I the, the, the legend of it somehow is that he, I think he woke up after having a dream and then immediately liter- like wrote most of the thing down in about 15 minutes and then went back to bed. But it Maybe is. I, it, I didn't have, I didn't heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it was, it just came to mind. But again, I, stunning, absolutely stunning song. And it, 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 it catches you by surprise when you hear it the first time because you like, like I said, I, you know, you hear the opening bit with David and it's like, it's like, this sounds a little bit like Madrigada, but in a, in a more black metal kind of way. Um, <laughs> did you had you known David before, or was it somebody that you actually reached out to to, to sing on the album? No, we knew know each other since 2018. Um, I filled in on guitars for Crippled Black Phoenix on a small tour through the Balkans, and you know he's Hungarian and uh, from Budapest. So we played on this tour. We played in Budapest, picked him up, and um, played the rest of the tour. Yeah, through the Balkans until uh, Athens in Greece. Um, and I heard him playing his songs every night and I watched him every night and was just blown away by his perform- performance and voice, but especially f- by his kind human nature and uh, humble character. And um, we asked him if he can imagine to do a support for us, for the Weg einer Freiheit later, on a tour in 2019 and on this tour all the other bandmates uh, got to know him and it was just a perfect uh, match and uh, we are friends ever since that time and that just yeah was kind of logical for me to have him somehow contributing on the album so i asked him if he can imagine uh doing a guest vocal part and not just uh, like a not just uh, uh supporting guest vocal part but he's the vocalist on this song, actually. Mm. Um, without him, the song is not the song anymore. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So it's a different thing from just a standard guest vocal part for me. Yeah. And so straight after that, you go into Morgan, uh, which and then and then Gig and Das Licht. Talk me through both of those uh, those those tracks. Gig and Das Licht means give me give me light, correct? Uh, against the light. Actually. Against the light. Okay. Yeah. Um, Morgan is, yeah, as you, as you 
probably heard like a very very fast aggressive song actually the most aggressive song on the album it was the most difficult to record especially for tobias because it's three minutes straight blasting or something like that and uh, then just the, the the song opens up and no blasting anymore um but he always had to suffer a lot going through the first three minutes um yeah but uh for us, we released it at the first single um, with a music video. As for us, it represents actually a nice um, showcase of all the of, of what happens on on all the album. Like it also have a very very strong sub bass synthesizer part in it and um, a different vocal uh, style, which is done by our bassist in the middle of the song somewhere and. Yeah, uh, just nothing too special about the song, like nothing new, really new happens, um, but still a, a, a very, yeah, like we wanted to make sure that we don't upset anyone actually with the first release in four yeah. years. We wanted to make sure that, you know, we could have released Immortal as the first single, but we thought like uh, that could be difficult mm -hmm. for people. Yeah, and you didn't want to pull a, a death heaven on people either. <laughs> yeah. So, and by the way, I, I uh, w my interpretation of that um, uh, of that song was of of, of uh, given das Licht. It's uh, it's based on I can speak Afrikaans, so I, I've spoken to folks a lot about this before. I, I used to okay. like if you sp can speak Afrikaans, you can kind of understand. You can figure out what they're trying to say in German to about a fifty percent accuracy. Yeah. Um, that's how I used to do all my shopping for music before I used to go through the nuclear blast catalogs. And then, you know, you kind of try and figure out between the German what, uh, okay, you know, this Samuel band, cool album cover. It says, you know, cult black metal, so it must be great. So Ceremony yeah. of Opposites, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll order that. But, um, okay, so let's let's move on then to, to Haven because that to me is is just, a, it's it's so surprising, but it's just such a beautiful way to end the record. And I must ask you about those Radiohead influences. Am I correct there or am I, am I wrong? Because there's definitely a strong, there's a strong, I could hear Tommy York singing the song when I heard it. You're definitely correct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Exit Music, one of Radiohead songs, is one of the best songs ever written for me. I uh, There's a massive connection to this song. Um, and not this song in particular, but... Definitely Radiohead was an um, important influence writing this song, Haven. Um, and it was the second song I wrote for the album. So the first one was Immortal and the second one was Haven. And after sending these two songs to the band guys, they, they asked me like, well, is this how the new record will sound like? <laughs> they yes. like the song. They like the so songs a lot, but I had to say then... Uh, well, no, there will be uh, more traditional songs as well. That was the plan, at least. Um, and uh, yeah, Haven was a song I wrote also in the night um, with just the guitar and the vocals and writing both at the same time, which actually also never happened before. I always write the music first and do all the details and having the song instrumentally um, being a finished song and having the vocals then on top is just the cherry on the cake, like uh, putting the the last bit on, on the top. But for Haven, it was without the vocals, the song doesn't work. And that was a new approach. Uh, I, I have never done it in, in the past, actually. And that makes the song also special and actually also makes it possible to only play it with one guitar and the vocal. Mm. Uh, are you playing that song live as well? Not on this tour, unfortunately. Um, we definitely want to play the song live, but uh, it, yeah, uh, to be fully honest, um, this tour is really complicated uh, mentally because of the pandemic and everything happening around the tour. We're very fort fortunate and lucky and happy that the shows are happening, but um, you know, there's always this kind of inner stress inside of me and this song is so fragile and personal i'm really kind of afraid to perform it and fuck it up so uh i just 
want to be get myself into um, the most secure situation when performing it and that's not the case on this tour and that's why we're not playing it mm-hmm. yeah and, and i guess also again it's it's like because it's so personal i could understand some apprehension breaking it out to a crowd that want to hear blasting black metal um you know and you kind of want to know how, how they're going to take it from my perspective I, like i said i love it and just on on, on the radio head topic um uh, everything in its right place that that to me is i i cannot begin to count how many times i've listened to that song in part because i always use it if i'm if i'm making any changes to the hi-fi i always use it to 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 uh to test i am if i'm swapping out cables yeah you always have one song something you feel very connected to you think it has a great production i do this as well with a music what's Um, your what so so what's what what is your songs just out of interest when you're doing any sort of any you know audio calibration testing anything like that yeah mostly it's uh muse um what's the song called some song on this hallabaloo album it was just a a b-side album i think um yeah from 20 years ago or something like that yeah it's it's some new song um and for like whenever i compare a mastering or a mix to mostly a metal mix um to know if it's loud enough if it's frequency wise if it's even and stuff like that i uh take um how is it called uh, a nail song wound open white maybe you know it oh yeah, yeah. The yeah most brutal song ever written i think um and if i get close to something uh with with a mix or a mastering i do to this song i know uh yeah it will be uh loud enough <laughs> so i'm always taking this song as a reference to yeah to being over the top yeah, because yeah, if yeah. i'm louder than this yeah i have to turn it down yeah. again. <laughs> now my, my my metal reference song when it comes to audio calibration there's probably anything anything off the last couple of paradise lost albums because i think it's very well recorded and it's very well mixed yeah. uh, or um uh, malum of the last mayhem record um which okay. i think I, I i know a lot of people complain about the mixing of that ro- record i don't give a fuck i love it i think it's awesome mm-hmm. I, I, I you need to be able to hear necro which is bass he's like you know it's instrumental to that band um but uh cool man so so what's what's next then for the band now so you you're, you're busy with this tour right now provided we can kind of go back to some level of normality what's going to be what's the next couple of months going to going to hold for you um we're playing a couple of shows next year uh already um announced some summer festivals which we're really looking forward and everyone's looking forward because two years of no festivals almost um it's a hard time but uh things yeah you never know uh you know pandemic always proved us wrong whenever we thought like oh it's getting better it didn't actually and uh but we really hope to be able to play these festivals next year and uh, we're having a tour uh planned in october november like a full european tour um trying to get as many countries as possible and uh after all well the uk is is one of the our main markets we want to explore more and um of course the us as well because we're getting very very much feedback from i was just about to tell you like you you are 100 sure you'd you'd go over very well in the us yeah yeah. uh and also the label tells us well you have to go to the us but it's not that easy unfortunately um you know the visa stuff and uh, you know we we're not a full-time band we're not doing this full-time so um everyone's got his job and uh mostly uh logistically it's not so easy to to set up a tour um but we will we will try and you'll, um, yeah. you'll persevere i've got one more question for you has yeah. anybody told you that you look like dave gohan from depeche mode like a, no, around the faith and devotion era yeah I okay. I, I've been thinking Never it like ever. through the whole of this interview, like he looks exactly like Dave Gahan, or at least like Dave Gahan's little brother. So, All right, okay. That could I'm, be a, I'm a massive Depeche Mode fan, by the way. So okay, I'm, okay. Uh, that's a, that's a compliment. Did you hear? But did you hear his cover of uh, Nothing Else Matters? No. 
fucking brilliant really? brilliant okay. I, like, I, that. I mean that's such an overplayed song and this you know blacklist bullshit that metallica put out i you know i saw the yeah. bands on there i was like garbage i don't want to you know, mm-hmm. i don't hear this and then i heard um jeff from the necromaniacs podcast talking about it uh to mike hill from tombs and he was saying how good it is and i was like yep. okay i you know i both these dudes i respect their opinions massively so when then i i checked it out and like Whoa, whoa it is incredible absolutely right. fucking incredible um That's definitely crazy, would man. recommend you you, you check, check it out, it out. it's mm-hmm. and it's so weird like when you hear it it's like this is such a perfect song for him to do why did i ever think that why did i ever doubt him so um anyway but listen my man i've had an absolute blast talking to you thank you so much uh for the you time and, and again congratulations on a fucking spectacular record uh i'm looking forward to hopefully seeing you guys in the, in the uk at some point but um, you know, at, at the very least down the road, I hope I get to uh, shake your hand and have a beer. Hopefully. It was a pleasure, Jackie. Uh, thanks for all your questions or rather this talk. It was like a, a, a very natural flow, which is always I'll take that sound by now. Use it to advertise this show. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so no, that, that that's no, good, man. Like I said, my my biggest um my the biggest thing for me is I, I never I never want this to be a QA type podcast yes yeah. it's, it's i yeah. never started it to be that i started yeah. it to be the antithesis and of I, that, so. if it's a podcast uh so um a podcast is rather a talk than just a q a and uh yeah yeah you did a great job <laughs> and uh, i appreciate, I appreciate the kind words <laughs> um i felt very well and uh really was nice to talk about some secrets as well and yeah cool all right my man take care of yourself uh good luck for the rest of the tour mm-hmm. and hopefully we speak again at some point soon Hopefully, man. Thank you, man. Take care. Bye-bye.
That was Immortal by Der Weg Einer Freiheit off of their new record Nocturne that's available on Season of Mist Records right now and uh, I will apologize if you felt a little bit of deja vu listening to that podcast uh, when I started talking about Gaul and about uh, my experiences of the uh, dog adding her voice to the podcast episode. Um, it was, uh, I actually completely forgot that I'd already spoken about it on the show. So I, uh, when, when she started fucking yapping in the background, uh, it seemed like an appropriate time to share it with Nikita. But, um, as I was editing the Fred and Stahl episode, I, I did kind of think to myself, fuck man, I've already spoken about this before, but, uh, either way, great dude. And like I said, make sure that you get hold of that record. And I would love to have that guy on the show again at some point. Um, I think there's still plenty to talk about. Um, speaking of someone I would love to have on the show, the mysterious figure behind Ars Magna Umbra um, is uh, somebody I think for sure should come on here at some point, if only to explain how he has managed to turn around such a fucking incredible record inside of 12 months. Um, those who have followed the show for a long time will know that last year uh, in my best of uh, 2020 episode, uh, the Ars Magna Umbra record Apotheosis uh, featured at number 19, I believe. Uh, and in short order, the uh, the sole member KM has now turned things around uh, and released his next record, Thrown Between Worlds. Uh, like uh, Apotheosis, it's also available on iVoid Hanger Records, consists of six tracks and, uh, across a time span of about 37 minutes. Um, and it is basically... It reminds me a little bit of this, the Seinfeld episode where he's uh, traveling in first class with this uh, supermodel and the air hostess comes by and asks, uh, you know, would you like anything else, sir? And Jerry goes, more anything, more everything. Basically, that's what's happened with uh, Ars Magna Umbra. All of the great things about Apotheosis has had the volume cranked up. So everything from the, you know, really gnarly discordant riffing uh, that uh, that was employed on that record um, you know, through to the ambience, uh, the atmosphere, you know, the atmospheric bits, the keyboards, um, you know, the, the the progressive parts, the melodies, everything just seems dialed up, you know, well past 11. Um, you know, and on top of that, I think the, the production is is somewhat improved. Um, I actually think the, the songwriting is somewhat improved as well. And it, it does feel when you listen to this record uh, end to end. It does feel like a more continuous, um, but also kind of somewhat more self-contained journey, by which I mean the songs all sort of have their own unique um, unique character and their own unique traits, but there's kind of this thread that runs through all of it as well. I mean, it, it's it's just one of those records that you're going to want to listen to over and over again. Um, I, I've had it on repeat probably for the last uh, two, three weeks, ever since I first heard the record, and I think it is absolutely fucking fantastic. You are going to think so also. Uh, and you're about to find out why when I play one of my favorite tracks off the album for you. This is Treader on the Dreamless Path.
Ars Magna Umbra there with uh, Treader on the Dreamless Path off of uh, the new record Throne Between Worlds. It's available right now on iVoid Hangar Records. Um, and uh, like I said, absolutely top-notch stuff. Um, in my opinion, easily beats uh, Apotheosis, which was uh, a top 20 contender back in 2020. And uh, that best of 2021 list, uh, as I've said before, the uh, the battle for uh, an opportunity to be featured there um, keeps getting uh, more and more fierce. I mean, that Ars Magna Ombra record is for sure a contender. Another record that's a contender, the new Hordem Rife. Um, these guys have been around since 2014. They're based out of Norway. And uh, in many ways, they continue along the Norse traditions of um, semi-melodic, grim, dark, cold, evil, speedy riffing. Um, I would say that uh, this new record, Winds of Wrath, uh, which is available right now on Territorial Possessions, uh, probably dials back some of the, the kind of unhinged aggression of the previous records, uh, of which they have had two full lengths that have come out so far. Um, Dome Dachsgvad, uh, which came out in 2017, and then its sequel, Nidhimner of Hut, which came out uh, in 2018. And then they've had a couple of EPs and stuff in between, but this is their third official full length. Um, and, uh, you know, again, in, in my opinion, I think it kind of dials back some of the stuff that maybe became a little, um, uh, I wouldn't say too much or redundant. But just kind of, you know, meant that those previous records had the tendency towards veering towards the the one dimensional, um, whereas this album feels far more well-rounded um, and the songs feel like they are far more kind of fleshed out uh, and far more, uh, I wouldn't say maybe even not, not experimental, but just a little more creatively free than uh, what these guys have done before. That being said, make no mistake about it. You, you, If you know Hordem Rife's music, you're going to uh, recognize this immediately. Uh, you know, they do have a very distinct style, um, you know, and there's a, uh, you know, and it's there. there is certainly plenty of that on show. Yeah, it's not like they're taking a, a step into completely different territory. But across six tracks, 45 minutes, uh, they rarely put a, uh, a step wrong, in my opinion. Uh, and I've heard a, I can't remember whether it was Invisible Oranges or whether it was No Clean Singing that described this as a record that'll remind you why you fell in love with black metal in the first place. I think that's an absolutely perfect description. Um, and uh, I'm going to once again prove why uh, by playing the title track off the record. Uh, this is Hordem Rife with Winds of Wrath.
Winds of Wrath by Hordem Rife uh, off of the uh, the album of the same name, uh, Winds of Wrath, and it's available on Territory Possessions right now. Uh, so do make sure that you go and check it out. Um, very, very good stuff. And like I said, if you like that uh, kind of second wave Scandinavian vibe that they have, there's plenty of that on this record. Uh, top-notch stuff. So now let's get to voices. And um, I have spoken about this band so many times on the show. Obviously, I've had Sam Loins on the podcast several times, uh, you know, and he will most certainly be back at some point soon as well. Um, uh, initially, as uh, many of you know as well, the plan was to uh, to get everybody from the band on to talk uh, about this new record for episode 100. But uh, due to various scheduling conflicts, that couldn't happen. Either way, uh, the new record is out. It's called Breaking the Trauma Bond. Uh, it's their first for Church Road Records. Um, I believe all of their previous records were released on Candlelight. Uh, it's the follow-up to Frightened, which came out in 2018. Um, and in some ways, I'd say it's a perfect sequel to that record. If you kind of draw a... a if you if you if you can craft a narrative that connects all four of their records so you know from the human forest create a fuge of imaginary rain that came out in 2013 was kind of their black metal album and then london is when they started to um uh, experiment with some really avant-garde progressive kind of crazy stuff whilst retaining that black and death metal strain um and then frightened was was in many ways like the aftermath of of london uh you know it was where you know all the craziness of london almost stopped and became uh, it became quite introspective um, and in many ways it, it, it's it's a record from whence I, I feel a lot of sadness emanating breaking the trauma bond is kind of a combination between the two uh, it's it's it sits in terms of atmosphere and in terms of uh, I guess the the general emotion that you get from it it, it kind of sits between London and frightened. But in terms of ambition, in terms of scope, and in terms of how much is added here by way of various different influences, there's no comparison. I mean, this is the this is the most um, you know the, the 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 biggest record they've ever done. This is the the record that's the most ambitious, um, whilst kind of clawing back a lot of the heaviness that frightened um, you know tossed out the window. Um, Knowing Sam as I as I do, I'd be curious to know, and I'm, I'm this is why I'm excited to have him on the podcast. Which songs he contributed to this record? Because there's a couple of moments here where they bring in um, really kind of cinematic soundscapes. A great example being uh, the opening song uh, "A Field Without Crows," which almost reminds me a little bit of Johnny Greenwood, uh, who did the "There Will Be Blood" soundtrack, and who, if you remember, the first time he was on this podcast, we spoke about at length. And then that suddenly gives way to, you know, nastiness, heaviness, um, you know, and kind of typical voices or delivered in a typically voices style. But throughout the record, there there are these moments of, like like I said, these, this kind of sort of cinematic beauty followed by, uh, you know, choruses that, that, you know, could almost be suitable to a pop song but you know pop songs in the in the 1980s vein in the uh, kind of Depeche Mode um, Sisters of Mercy Susie and the Banshees just that you know ultra catchy ultra melodic but constantly contrasted with some of that craziness you know the the discordance the the speed the you know, aggression some of the you know that those hints of black metal it, it, it's 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 an album that is just I, I mean, I, I think I find it hard to kind of put into words properly. And, and interestingly, having read a couple of reviews of it now as well, it seems like a lot of other people are struggling to kind of properly describe it. I will, I will ditch any attempts to do so and just call it what it is. And that is a work of fucking genius. It's 68 minutes long. I know, uh, you know, the band believe that it is the the finest thing they've ever done. I don't disagree. I think it's the best thing that Voices has ever done. Um, and I hinted earlier at the, the battle for, uh, for, you know, best album of 2021, you know, these guys have, uh, have laced on the old gloves and are, are, you know, making a hell of a case for them to be, uh, included on that list. Um, this, this really is sensational. If you liked any of the stuff that, uh, you, that they've released so far, so the track breaking the trauma bond an audience of mannequins methods of madness and i believe the other one they did was uh, beckoning shadows i mean basically brace yourself because the rest of the album is along the same lines broken up here and there by some of those those soundscapes like i said um you know and by a few things that you know maybe will come as a bit of a surprise but in terms of quality it's 
everything is everything is consistently brilliant from start to finish um phenomenal stuff and i'm gonna play a track for you right now off of it called ghost city You just listened to Ghost City by Voices off their new record, Breaking the Trauma Bond. It's available on Church Road Records right now. Like I said, um, 
easily on the shortlist for my favorite record of uh, 2021 and uh, you know after having waited a good uh, three four years for these guys to make a new record the lads have not disappointed uh, what has disappointed me however and I hinted at uh, talking about some personal news at the top of the podcast so I'll just share that now uh, is the fact that uh, a couple of days ago the hammer came down on travel to South Africa. South Africa has now been placed back on the uh, the English red list for travel. So no more flights, no more anything. Um, I mean, even if you did, even if you were able to travel, you would need to quarantine on the way back. And there is no fucking way that I'm paying four thousand pounds for myself, and my girlfriend, to basically live in a glorified prison, which is what those quarantine packages are. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, just reading, uh, the, the, the news here, it says flights from South Africa will be banned with six countries placed under England's, uh, red list travel restrictions after scientists raised the alarm over what is feared to be the worst COVID-19 variant yet identified. Whitehall sources say, uh, said that the B11529 virus or sorry, virus variant known as the new variant, uh, similar to new metal, which I suspect is what they have uh, named it after because it's equally fucking stupid. Uh, it's feared to be more transmissible and has the potential to evade immunity, posed a potentially significant threat to the vaccine program, which we have to protect at all costs. Um, will this be like the last South African variant, which was a massive storm in a teacup um, meant to kill us all, but had no real impact, much like the Delta variant and many of the other variants that they use as an excuse to lock us down? Uh, I don't know, but uh, either way, uh, I am now third time unlucky. I've been attempting to celebrate my 40th birthday since fucking 2019. Uh, and uh, I believe that next year when I turn 42, I will still not have celebrated it. And frankly, I've kind of given up on the idea of, of ever spending Christmas with my uh, with my family again. I don't think it's going to happen. I think these lockdowns are here to stay. And I think once the fucking COVID lockdowns end, the climate lockdowns will begin. Um, the governments, the bureaucracy have got a taste for power and control now. And they, they Michael Malice said this on, on the Joe Rogan podcast, and I totally agree with him. A lot of very evil people have been watching how we respond to what's going on. And uh, they've been taking notes. And you can bet your fucking sweet ass uh, that this is, uh, this is not the first, this is not the last, you know, global crisis that'll, you know, have them... Uh, impinging upon our freedoms, uh, which is what they're doing. Um, um, again, I may stand corrected, and maybe this, you know, this variant will be as serious as they're saying, but somehow I doubt it. And I also don't believe a shred of what comes out of the mainstream media. You know, this is the same mainstream media that uh, twenty years ago tried to convince us that. Um, there was definitely weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and, you know, Saddam Hussein was an existential threat to the West, uh, which turned out to be bullshit. Uh, they have tried for the last four years to convince us that Russiagate is definitely real. And, and uh, until recently, um, you know, kept on pushing that nonsense, uh, even though people involved in that whole scam have been arrested. Um, you know, and then uh, more recently, they referred to uh, that scumbag who plowed his SUV into a group of people at a Christmas parade in, in Wisconsin as an accident, when the video evidence clearly shows the guy turning his car and then flooring it uh, as though to do it on purpose. But it doesn't fit the narrative, so therefore it doesn't get, uh, it doesn't get their attention the way real news should. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'll still get my second shot of the vaccine, but I, I must be perfectly honest as well. The, the, the more this goes on, the more my um, my skepticism about the vaccine continues to grow because this was sold as something that's supposed to stop transmission. It's supposed to keep us safe. And then all of every so often something else whack comes up that, uh, you know, supposedly renders it powerless or means we have to get our third booster and our fourth booster and our fifth booster. And, you know, I, I that I keep coming back to that meme where people say that um you know pharma doesn't uh, heal people they create customers that's exactly what's going on yeah um you know and until i actually hear some common sense talk about how people should be taking care of their health with regards to exercise proper supplementation proper diet accompany the uh, the, the bleating about getting the vaccine I, I i won't really ever believe that they have our best interest at heart um 
And uh, much as I hope I'm wrong on this one, it would not surprise me if in years to come, there are mass outbreaks of cancer, cardiac issues, people having heart attacks, and they start linking linking it back to this vaccine. I, I, I truly, truly hope I'm 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 wrong about it, but um, I just I just have a nasty feeling. I have the exact same feeling I had when they were talking about weapons of mass destruction in in Iraq. Uh, you know the way in which they, it's like they're it's like they're trying too hard to convince us of something. Either way, it doesn't matter whether you vaccinate it or not because the uh, the terrifying new variant is going to get you. Um, I've, you know, I know at the end of the day, uh, I'm no worse off than anybody else. As a matter of fact, I know people who, uh, you know, probably hit far harder by this. Uh, I, uh, I've gone ahead and canceled all my flights and everything like that. All the plans that we had for, uh, for the trip. Um, you know, some folks handled themselves very well during that. Uh, Gondwana Game Reserve immediately gave me my refund. Great people. Uh, Laird's Country Lodge uh, in Plettenberg Bay can fucking suck it. Um, they uh, they still charged me a 50% cancellation fee in spite of the fact that, um, you know, it's circumstances entirely outside of my control. And you actually had the option on the place that I booked it to get a free, what's say, uh, free cancellation. Um, but they sent me this fucking pathetic insipid message. Hi, Jackie. Unfortunately, the 30-day booking.com cancellation is in place. 50% of total cost. We are, however, happy to defer to a later date. To which I responded, unfortunately, uh, sorry, unfortunate for me to be doubly penalized for circumstances entirely outside of my control. For you, it's a 50% windfall on a booking you will almost certainly replace within the next 24 hours. Not only would I never consider rebooking with you again, but I fully intend to make everyone in my personal and professional network aware of your approach to customer service. So if any of you are planning to go to South Africa, boycott Laird's Country Lodge. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say, man. I, I, I wish I could be more positive and more hopeful, but, uh, you know, uh, you work your fucking stones off to try you know with with this kind of view that you've got that little break coming at the, the lights at the end of the tunnel and it gets taken away from you and it's just fucked up like i don't know when i'm going to see my family again um and i don't know when the, when life is going to go back to normal i'm just waiting for the next next lockdown yeah you know gyms shut everything you know restaurants shut everything you know going back to where we were last uh, last christmas um because the reality is like i said the powers that be have, you know, they know now how they can go, uh, go about controlling us, and I don't think they're ever going to stop. I wish I, uh, you know, I wish that uh, that were not so, but uh, until I see something to give me some, some, until I see something tangible to give me some real hope, uh, I, I, I just don't see the situation getting any better. Uh, so uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's let's change gears just a wee tad and move over to uh, the uh, the new segment for this week. And first up on Metal Storm, uh, we see that Immolation have revealed a new music video for Rise of the Heretics. Uh, the latter taken off the band's 27 record, uh, 2017 record, I should say, Atonement. Uh, it was a band performance filled at Dark City Studios in Yonkers, New York. I was, I'd was i actually forgotten about this song um, and I uh, was quite excited because I thought it would be a, a new Immolation track. I know they're actually working on a uh, on, on an album right now. But uh, yeah, this song um, to me was, uh, its it never really did it much for me. As a matter of fact, I think Atonement was good, but... Um, it wasn't on the same level as Kingdom of Conspiracy or Majesty and Decay. Um, I, I, I like Immolation when they do more of the kind of slowed down, atmospheric, dark stuff. Uh, you know, when they try and get fast, they, you know, they, they, they're, they're good. But, you know, I feel like I've heard that a hundred times before. Um, and I would prefer for them to, uh, you know, like for me, like one of the best Immolation song, songs ever is Our Savior Sleeps. Um, and that to me is when they are firing on all cylinders, uh, when they play in that style. Um, but you know why they're releasing this music video now? I don't know. Uh, it says it was directed by Robert Wigner, so I, I assume it probably he probably just did it as a bit of an experiment, and they decided let's put it out. For the most part, as I've said before, I don't really give a fuck about music videos. Um, I don't mind, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mind lyric videos, but it's not like I sit there and watch music videos end to end multiple times. <clears throat> um, so let's move on. 
Uh, Warbringer, withdraw from Euro Tour with Nov- uh, Novosa. Uh, begin writing new material. Warbringer drummer Carlos Cruz recently announced through a video on Facebook that due to medical issues, they will no longer be co-headlining a European tour with Novosa in the spring of next year. He also confirmed that the band has commenced the songwriting process for the follow-up to last year's Weapons of Tomorrow. I uh, didn't see the video, but um, you know, I hope he's you know, I hope he's all right. Uh, whatever's going on. Cold tracking tunes for seventh album. Uh, Norwegian black metal purveyors Cold have entered the studio earlier this month and begin tracking songs for their seventh long player due out next year. This will be their first one in eight years following 2014's Till Enders. Great, great record. And Cold is a, a band I really actually feel I should go back and revisit. The problem is there is just so much fucking cool stuff that's come out this year. You know, it gets a bit uh, gets a bit tricky justifying, uh, you know, what you you know what you go back to if you want to deep dive into a band's old catalog but you know generally speaking i've always found them to be super entertaining until enders uh i do recall you know uh, enjoying in particular so uh, glad they're back and, and glad they're making new music uh you know the the 2021 lineup has been sick um but the 2022 lineup is uh, is already set to uh to equal or uh, or eclipse that you know and the thing that's always exciting about metal year in and year out is that there's always those big titles that you look forward to. Like, for example, next year, you know, without a doubt, I'm, I'm excited to hear the new Marduk, if, you know, if it comes out. Super excited to hear the new Immolation if it comes out. You know, there's there's big names that will release new records next year. But it always seems to be the smaller bands, uh, you know, the bands that aren't, you know, necessarily the, the, the AAA releases uh, that put out the best stuff. So, um yeah, uh, very, very excited about what 2022 brings us. Um, one of the things it will bring us as well is uh, a new record by Hammerfall. <laughs> so, I, I think I have mentioned this on the podcast before, but uh, on my personal Facebook page, there's a photo of uh, Fat Me from 20, I think it's 2007, uh, where I was out with the guys from Hammerfall at a, a shitty little dive called Garlic and Shots in Soho in London such nice guys um and i felt so bad about having to review their album poorly because uh as much as they're nice guys their music is absolute pooey poo um broken hope working on their next full-length effort uh, according to guitarist jeremy wagner illinois-based death metal masters broken hope are working on the successor to their 2017 album mutilated and assimilated genius song genius album the eighth uh, studio album is planned to be released in late 2022 early 2023 that's quite a quite a ways away but uh i didn't have jeremy on the show this year uh which i kind of always thought should be a uh, an annual tradition i'm gonna see if i can get that uh, rectified early next year i know he's been working on his media company stagian media and he's got his writing and all of his stuff but uh, he's a fucking cool dude good good you know person i regard as a very good friend um and uh i've said this on the show before broken hope in my opinion are one of the best live death metal experiences you will ever have if not the best and i know that's saying a lot but both times that i've seen them over the course of the last uh well, on, five six years um they have been fucking phenomenal it looks like like their music is just written for uh for the stage written to crush um, you know, and and they also have a incredible secret weapon in their arsenal uh, by way of Damien, their vocalist, who just looks awesome on stage, um, and who uh, you know his voice on stage is I, f- I feel translates a lot better than on on album. But uh, either way, super excited about hearing that. And uh, fun fact for those of you that are new to the podcast and don't know it, the name into the Necrosphere is a uh, living tribute to uh, what's name to Broken Hope uh ghost confirm european shows booey boo uh just one the reason i stopped on ghost i was was listening back to uh the new dread sovereign record uh alchemical warfare uh earlier on in the week and i was reminded of one thing with regards to that band like a perfect way to describe them dread sovereign is ghost for (laughs) grown-ups So if you haven't listened to that Alchemical Warfare record yet, by the way, it is fantastic. Uh, featuring, of course, friend of the show, Alan Averill of Primordial fame. Um, it really is ghost for grown-ups. You know, it's it's kind of like old school speed and heavy metal, um, you know, with a satanic bent, um, but just 
absolutely brilliant. Um, moving on. Uh, let's see what else there is. <laughs> Am I was about to say ambulance. I almost thought it said ambulance. I was like, Jesus, are, are we... Uh, are we trying to compete with uh, with Custard for shittiest band name on the face of the earth? Ambulance. I fucking bet there's a band called Ambulance as well. Uh, well, no, I, I, <laughs> I take that back because Ambulance would pale in comparison to the Flower Kings, which is as far as shit band names are concerned. But uh, anyways, uh, let's see. Uh, Custard, speak of the devil and they will appear. Stormkeep uh, put out video for a journey through storms. Uh, American black metalers Stormkeep have just put out their sophomore record, Tales of Other Time. This is still one I need to spend some time with. Um, I've, I've noticed a lot of people talking about this and getting awful excited about it. Um, so uh, I, I for sure, for sure need to uh, study up on it. I might try and spend some time with it ahead of the, the next episode and uh, tell all y'all what I think. Corpse Grinder, debut solo album on the way. Legendary Cannibal Corpse frontman George Corpse Grinder Fisher announces his debut solo album, Corpse Grinder, to hit the streets on February 4th via Perseverance Music Group. Spoke about this last week. Um, I would assume that uh, he will release that record alongside a lengthy, full and frank apology for the mean and awful things that he said back in 2008 uh, when being interviewed about... Um, uh, World of Warcraft, one of the most overrated turd games ever made. Um, but yeah, he was, uh, for all intents and purposes, he was cancelled. Um, so I'm surprised that uh, that Jamie has aligned to him. Um, but uh, either way, I said this last week, I like the idea that Jamie has to do this uh, Perseverance Records um, project where he kind of has these dudes and he does... Solo solo stuff with him. Uh, I know he spoke to Rob Dukes, uh, formerly of Exodus, about doing one as well, uh, and which I think is a great idea. Okay, uh, let's head over to the Democrats' Guide to Rock Music, better known as Blabbermouth. And first up, they have rene renowned spousal... <laughs> spousal assassin uh tim lambesis as i lay dying frontman tim lambesis is born through fire project drops music video for blood fire pain uh am i correct in saying that born through fire uh was or the name was inspired by him being incapable of properly lighting a barbecue fire uh, and apparently spraying a bunch of lighter fluid on him, which burned him, or on the fire, I should say, sorry, which burned him and burned someone else who was there as well. They're suing him. I mean, this guy's IQ, if it if it's beyond 75, I would be fucking shocked. He, he literally comes across and sounds to me like one of the biggest idiots on the face of the earth. Uh, Tony Iommi says he wrote one song on Ozzy Osbourne's upcoming solo album, Hurrah. Uh, here's the first taste of unearthed drum riffs from late Megadeth drummer Nick Menza, produced by Dave Ellison. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that because there is something else Megadeth related that uh, I want to talk about. Uh, maybe I'll find it further down the um, further down the list here, but uh, just a very quick one. Frank Bello on Anthrax's longevity. We are brothers. Uh, I know that uh, my friend Joel McIver is busy writing a book about uh, Frank Bellow's life. Uh, Joel is a, a top-notch dude and a, a guy who's written some great books over the years. Uh, might might get him on the podcast again at some point soon. Um, he was on back on, I think, like episode 17 or something, but a uh, great, great guy. Ah, oh, yeah, this was what I wanted to talk about. Is Megadeth's Euthanasia Dave Mustaine's most personal album when it comes to lyrics? He responds, uh, Megadeth Dave Mustaine was asked by a fan on Cameo if Euthanasia is lyrically his most personal album. He responded, as transcribed by Blabbermouth, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of personal songs that I have, but as far as most personal, each song they have their degree on how deep I go with what I reveal about myself. I mean, bullshit. We all know that uh, it can't possibly be his uh, most personal record because uh, the uh, the lyrics on Atou Le Mans are a lie. Um, you know, in the, the, the chorus where he says, uh, these are the last words I'll ever speak, 
We know that's wrong because the last words that Dave will ever speak is, as he's lying on his deathbed, fuck you, James. <laughs> it's either going to be, fuck you, James, or fuck you, Lars, or maybe even both. Um, and I know from, I've heard from sources inside the industry, um, you know, not wanting to spread any rumors, but just saying, you know, I've, people have spoken and, and told me that the original lyrics for the chorus to A Tu Le Mon was, A Tu Le Mon, Metallica sucks. <laughs> James Hetfield is a fucking wimp. I could have killed him with my jujitsu or the magic kindo, but my master warned me not to strike. Uh, what a bitter, bitter old prick. Um, and again, uh, he's charging purchases $299 for what I can only assume is five minutes of fucking sniveling on, uh, on Cameo. Um, <laughs> But uh, anyways, uh, one one little sidebar I noticed there. It says download on Am discover Megadeth. Download on Amazon Music. Uh, if you are an Amazon Music user, Into the Necrosphere is now on Amazon Music, so uh, you can check it out there. I don't know whether that means I'm also on Audible, but uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see. Speaking of Metallica, uh, watch pro shot video of Metallica performing "Fight Fire with Fire" and "Welcome to Rockville." I checked that out, and I'll tell you something. I was quite surprised by how good uh, James's voice sounded on that song. Um, that's normally been one of the songs where, when I've heard it in the past, you know, based on you know the fact that he's getting a little older, and you know, is is is, I wouldn't say losing the the timber, but losing a bit of the range in his voice. You know, that's always been a song that he struggled with a little bit. But on that recording in particular, that sounded pretty good to me. Also, another sidebar: if you haven't listened to it yet. Um, my uh, my brother Mike Hill on Everything Went Black did a really really cool episode about uh, Metallica Metallica's Load with Drew Murphy of Tombs. Very very cool episode, uh, very entertaining. Uh, Drew is a very big Metallica fan, and he was somewhat of a Load apologist, um, which obviously I was shocked didn't lead to his expulsion from the band. <laughs> but uh, no, I think the consensus was that uh, you know over the years now that the um, now that the shock has worn off, uh, Load is, in hindsight, not the worst album. I would agree. It's it's definitely not worse to me than um, uh, St. Anger. I think St. Anger is one of the most atrocious things ever recorded. Uh, I absolutely despise Death Magnetic, um, and I didn't really like the last record either. However, by contrast, I think that the song Bleeding Me is... is may, uh, this is going to be super controversial to a lot of people, maybe a contender in my mind for one of my favorite Metallica songs ever. I'll just throw that out there. Uh, so if you guys think Drew is false, get yourself a load of old Space Mountain over here. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a super fun episode. And that's a top-notch podcast. If you don't listen to it yet, you know, for sure um, start uh, subscribing to it. That and the Necromaniacs podcast, both brilliant. Uh, watch Mastodon perform Tear Drinker on Late Night with uh, Woke Seth Meyers. Uh, with the exception of Greg Gutfeld, I think all late night programming in North America is a total disgrace. Um, I think everybody from Kimmel through to Seth Meyers, they are all the least funny human beings alive. I mean, I don't even want, don't even get me started on fucking Stephen Colbert. Who, you know, if you had to have like a top five people that you would like five rounds in the octagon with, I would beat the fucking bejesus out of him. Um, and so sad as well, because when he was doing the Colbert Report, he was actually hysterically funny. Um, and then when he moved to, um, uh, what's him, to Letterman slot, I mean, fuck knows what happened. But anyway, uh, I, I will just say uh, this new Mastodon record is is not working for me i i know i may come to uh uh walk back those words um because they are they have been one of those bands that in the past you know i might not like something that they've put out and then you know several months later someone plays a tune and it just it just kind of catches me at the right time but uh i i just what i've heard so far i i, I really actually can't stand um i was listening to it in the car uh, driving to go drop my daughter off and that's usually a nice nice time to listen to music because it's a nice drive even though poor old jackson has been caught by the uh, gloucestershire constabulary and i have to do a speed awareness course soon but 
that that aside, uh, it's, it's a nice, pleasant drive. Good, good, good place to listen to music. I've got a very good sound system in my car, um, but uh, this album is just not. Uh, it's just not doing it for me. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that sounds very happy on it. It's, it's it, everything I like about the band seems to just be absence, absence, absent. Uh, okay, let's move on. Um, Grammy boss defends Marilyn Manson nomination. We won't look back at people's history. I've, that's also fucking hysterical because let's be honest. I mean, the Grammys, much like all of these fucking horseshit, uh, worthless, uh, award shows, um, you know, either know absolutely nothing about the, the people that they nominate, uh, or they just nominate people that kind of fit in inside of their circle. Um, and I, I, you know, I, again, I think these rewards are redundant. There used to be a time when, you know, the, the Oscars for me, as an example, used to be a, a celebration of great movies. I mean, there was a time when what if a ba- if a if it was an Oscar nominated film, it was generally worth watching. Those days are over. Um, you know, with the exception of Parasite, I can't recall a movie in the last couple of years that's been nominated for an Oscar that was worth anything. Um, and it's kind of the same with the Grammys. I mean, the Grammys has never meant anything to me. Um, you know, whatever slim shred of, uh, you know, meaning they, they did have disappeared when Jethro Tull got the best heavy metal award. Um, so, you know, Manson up for album of the year. <laughs> Who gives a fuck? He can, uh, you know, he, he might be able to buy some cigarettes with that award if he wins it uh, when he's in jail. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, let's see what else. Uh, Metallica partners with iconic mystery board game Clue. Um, this undoubtedly was um, sprout from the, I don't even think sprout is a word, but sprouted from the deranged mind of Lars Ulrich. Uh, it says, yeah, Metallica has partnered up with one of the most iconic American mystery games, Clue. Picture this, the band and crew are back at HQ to record Metallica's next album. But with all the excitement, a key piece of equipment has gone missing. That's right, the dildo that Lars sits on <laughs> Plays the drums. <laughs> no, I'm only, I'm only kidding. Lars, I, I, you know, he's he's someone who's easy to to tease, but uh, I kind of agree with the assessment of, that um, of all the Metallica dudes, I, I bet he'd be the one that would be one of the most fun to hang out with. But anyway, it says, yeah, as the hours tick by, the group grows more and more eager to begin. They decide to split up and scour the building for any trace of their missing equipment, find out what piece has gone missing, where it's hiding, and who finds it so the recording session can get back on track. Yawn, yawn, yawn. I don't know whose dumbass idea that was. Uh, it, I do think it, it, it may potentially have been, uh, have been Lars, but I mean, who the fuck would want something like that? You, you grown men, for Christ's sakes, or grown women. Um, ugh, anyways, uh, System of Down drummer rails against Los Angeles vaccine mandate, self-imposed tyranny, and mental slavery is rampant. Uh, I definitely think tyranny is rampant. I wouldn't even say it's self-imposed. I mean, yes, people voted for it, but uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, in all of these states where things are going dramatically wrong, uh, it's going to have to get worse before it gets better. Because if people keep voting for this dumb shit, they're going to get the same result. You know, Baltimore is a great example of where that's been going on for years. Uh, frankly, California is as well. Uh, you know, and the fact that people, uh, you know, v- v- voted Newsom back in during that recall election, uh, or effectively voted him back in in the recall election, I should say, um, they clearly like what he's doing. Uh, I might think that he's uh, amongst the worst governors of all time. And he's completely destroying the uh, the state, but uh, I don't live there, and uh, I didn't I didn't have any skin in the game in voting for him. Uh, so, uh, like I said, people need to live with the um, the consequences of what they vote for. Uh, ro- last one, then I'm going to end up uh, for the week. Uh, Baby on Nirvana's Nevermind cover amends lawsuit against band, cites Kurt Cobain's personal journal entries. You know, when I mentioned about the top five people I'd like to have five rounds in the octagon with. This fucking dweeb who is uh, suing uh, Nirvana for those for that photo, Spencer Eldon, is without a doubt one of the people that would make that list as well. So it says here, yeah, Spencer Eldon, the man who claims he was the baby featured on the cover of Nirvana's Nevermind album, has amended his lawsuit against the band to include the allegation that the photographer hired to take the photo, Kirk Weddle, also shot images of Eldon's style to look like Playboy founder Hugh Hefner. Gosh. 
The new filing also drops former Nirvana drummer Chad Channing as a defendant in the case. According to Rolling Stone, Alden's updated complaint cites personal journal entries from late Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain, which were published by Riverhead Books in 2002 in an attempt to prove the claim that the photographer intended the cover image to be sexual in nature. Uh, where is the fucking sexual malarkey that they supposedly uh, referring to here? The documents also repeat the claim that Weddle intended to trigger a visceral sexual response from the viewer by activating Spencer's gag reflex before throwing him underwater and poses highlighting and emphasizing Spencer's exposed genitals. The documents add Weddle soon after produced photographs of Spencer dressed up and depicted as Hugh Hefner. This guy very clearly has run out of money. No one wants to take photos with him at Comic-Con or whatever fucking bullshit little fucking signature stand hawk nonsense he, he attends. And uh, now he thinks to himself, I know, I'll, uh, I've, I've kept this little card up my sleeve uh, for the last 28 years or however long it's been. Time for me to play it. Um, but uh, you know, we'll we'll see what happens with that court case. Uh, the, uh, the the track record oh uh, oh the Justice Department in America, or well, actually not the Justice Department. I don't think they'll get involved in this crap. But when it comes to uh, courts in America, is uh, questionable. Um, so who knows? He's he's probably do uh, do a lot of money based on uh, based on past precedent. Uh, all right, folks, uh, I'm going to finish up for this week. Uh, uh, you uh, have probably heard just about enough of me, and uh, I've had just about enough of this news bullshit. Thanks very much if you have stuck it out all the way to the end of the show, uh, and thanks very much for indulging me here for six minutes if you did listen through the whole thing about me complaining about uh, my cancelled holiday. Uh, I'm fucking bummed about it. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like I said, there's a lot of people that have it a lot worse than me, but um, it, it fucking sucks. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm really annoyed about it. And you know, I wish there was something one could do, but I don't think that there is. And it, uh, I think it's the helplessness that uh, that pisses me off the most. But I will be back again next week. Uh, I've got a, a pair of guests in the pipeline uh for next week uh but uh, i'm not going to announce who they are yet because as you know uh I've, <laughs> so i've become so fucking paranoid that i know that if i say who it is undoubtedly it'll be cancelled so also when it comes to me booking my next holiday i prepare for me to just disappear for weeks on end <laughs> because if i if i mention to you that i'm going to south africa lockdown the very next day um but uh yeah i'll definitely be back next week uh I'll be, i've got a couple more uh waiting to be done so um you'll you'll have me for a few more episodes before the end of the year then i'm going to take a little break uh and then i'll be back in january but uh, i hope wherever it is that uh, all of you are whatever you're doing you're staying safe you're staying healthy you're staying out of harm's way and i will look forward to uh catching up with all of you bad motherfuckers again next week I'm going to play out with a song. Uh, I spoke about Mike Hill earlier. Uh, I know he is not the biggest fan of this record. I don't know how he feels about this song, but uh, I personally think that it is fucking phenomenal. Uh, off of the, I think it was 2017 record, The Grand Annihilation, this is Tombs with a song called Underneath. See you next week, everybody. Underneath.